Hi, I'm Igor, and my data science living in London, and in this video I explain to you what Bayesian stats is. A lot of comments I've got recently are about my videos being not too in-depth or something a bit more deeply mathematical. So in this video, I'm going to do exactly that. We're going to go for a real deep dive behind Bayesian stats. We'll go all the way from what probability is to applying Bayesian inference in practice. So with that, let's get into it. So the things we'll cover in this video will be understanding probability. Like I said, we'll go through all the different types of probability, what probability really means, what most people think it means, and how this links to Bayesian stats. We'll then explore Bayes' theorem. We'll derive the first principles, explain why it's important, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we'll go on to how we apply it in practice, right? So Bayesian theorem's good, as we know it, but how do we actually use it to make real world decisions? We'll then use a concept of Bayesian updating to do exactly that. We'll use Bayesian updating to help us make more informed decisions in practice. And the final kind of more advanced topic we'll touch upon is conjugate priors. I'll link all the timestamps for these various sections on screen here. Uh, there's also blogs in the description that links all these ideas we'll cover in this video so that if you want to get more of an in-depth understanding or just to supplement your learning a bit more, then make sure to check out those blogs that I've linked below. This whole slideshow as well and this whole deck will be available in the description as well. So if you're worried, you know, about, you know, not really understanding it too well, then you can feel free to check that out. Uh, there's a lot of material that will be covered in this. So if you want to know more, I highly recommend you check out the description to get that more, the more supplementary material that you're after. So with that, let's kind of go into why I'm making this video. So Bayes' theorem probability is something that's just well known with maths. It's decade, not decades old, it's centuries old, right? Kind of 1600s, 1700s. That's where Bayesian inference really started. And within data science, we use the word Bayesian quite a lot. And I feel like it gets lost in translation because, you know, it's one of these things that seems really cool, like, oh, I'm doing Bayesian learning. Um, but the reality is, I think a lot of people don't really know what it means. And that's kind of a problem because it's kind of like I said, you use it a lot, but quite erroneously. And the problem with that is that you get, you may meet someone who really knows what it means, and then you'd be like, oh, you know, kind of stumped because they kind of really don't understand what you're saying, but you know what Bayesian. And so in this video, I really want to go into what Bayesian means and where it's actually come from and how, you know, when people say we use Bayesian learning, what they really mean, like meaning behind that, because it's quite an important concept to really grasp as a whole, within data, as if you're a data scientist. So let's first begin with just discussing what probability really is. So the first thing when most people refer to probability, they actually refer to something called as marginal probability. And this is where, you know, is it just a probability of an event occurring? So a common example is what's the probability of flipping a head? And in this case, it's simply 50%, assuming we have an unbiased coin. So the marginal probability is just like I said, the regular layman view of probability, what is probability of something something happening, an event on its own? That's what marginal probability is. Now, we can extend that view in something called joint probability. And joint probability, this is where we take the probability of flipping two heads together. So what's the probability, you know, flipping one head, then flipping another head after? Well, in this scenario, there's four different outcomes. There's equal flip at two heads, equal flip a head and their tails, the tails are heads, or two tails. And because the probability of flipping two heads is you know one out of those four total outcomes of the state space, the probability of flipping two heads is then 25%. Or another way of doing it is the probability of flipping a head is 50%, the probability of flipping another coin is also 50%, so therefore 0.5 times 0.5 is 25%. And so joint probability is just a probability of two events happening um, together or in succession or I should say to get not succession that's a bit different um, and that will also all there is to it and if like then an important concept as well behind joint probabilities is the idea of let me say this word correctly cumulativity cumulativity so being commutative means that the probability of a and b is the same as the probability of b and a likewise three times two equals six and two times three also equals six and that's what it means. Depends whichever way you split them, doesn't really matter, the outcome's the same. This will become important later on when we derive Bayes' theorem just to understand this principle. 
The final type of like probability concept I want to cover is the idea of conditional probability. And this is where we have a probability of an event is impacted by some events conditional upon it. So the probability of events happening given some event has already occurred. A common example is a probability of picking the three of diamonds from a deck of hands given we already have a red card, right? So we know the probability of picking a three of diamonds from a deck is one out of 52. We know the probability of choosing a red card is a half, right? Because half the deck is red, so either a diamond or a heart. And so the probability of choosing a three of diamonds from a deck that's already only got red cards in it is one out of 26, which makes sense, right? We're just saying we calculate the probability or the marginal probability of picking a red of diamonds, one out of 52, and the probability of picking a red card is a half. So for the probability that we have in three of diamonds, given we already know the deck it only contains red cards, must be one out of 26. Again, nothing too complicated here. You were just using different marginal probabilities and dividing them to give us the given probability. So it really is that simple, nothing too complicated here. Again, if you are got a bit lost, just rewind the video and check those steps we've done there or check out the links in the description below regarding conditional probability. The official kind of mathematical definition behind it is like this. So probability well, for two events, A and B, can be expressed conditionally like this. The probability of A given B equals the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. Again, I've linked in the description below how you derive this, but this is just a well-known result within statistics. Um, you can prove this on first principles, but this is kind of a common formula that we've used quite a lot. Now let's go into Bayes' theorem. So we've discussed all the types of probabilities, and now we're going to link all those types to derive Bayes', Bayes theorem from scratch. So we can rearrange the conditional probability formula that we had here by simply multiplying the probability of B to the other side of the equation. So what we get here is the probability of A and B equals the probability of B times the probability of A given B. Now remember what I said earlier about probability of A and B happening is commutative. So probability of A and B is the same as probability of B and A. And we can use that information to rearrange this left side of the formula to equal this. So this is just probability of B given A, or B and A, sorry, I should say. Getting confusing here. And this is kind of just a simple expression. All we've done is just manipulated this formula to input certain values that we know about conditional probability and uh, joint probability. And our, when we from this expression, all we do then is divide by the probability of B, and then we get something like this. We get probability, or sorry, probability of, yeah, probability of B. And all we get is this result. We get probability of A given B equals the probability of A times the probability of B given A divided by the probability of B. And this is Bayes' theorem. That's all there is. So we basically just derive Bayes' theorem all the way from marginal probabilities, um, joint probabilities, and conditional probabilities. And this is what I really want you to understand now is that Bayes' theorem is not, the form, this formula is not Bayes' statistics. It's just Bayes' theorem. And Bayes' theorem is a way, just a way of just expressing conditional probability in a different form. There's nothing about this that's Bayes inherently. The kind of Bayes statistics and inference comes from how we apply that formula and how we apply it in the like in philosophical arguments behind how we think about statistics. But on its own, Bayesian stats or Bay the Bayes theorem, sorry, is completely correct. There's nothing you know controversial about it. It's just rearranging known formulae into a certain format. It's how we apply this formula in practice is where Bayesian stats and frequenter stats become different. And that's kind of the key point I really, really, really want you to take home now. It's Bayesian, Bayes' theorem is nothing special. It's just a rearrangement of conditional probability formula. It's how we apply it is what makes it special. So Bayes' theorem is composed of four parts. The probability of A is something known as a prior. And a prior is basically an example, it's an example where you would have some knowledge about uh, an event happening you may know before so you know i may know that when liverpool play say luton liverpool are the more likely team to win right 
that's a basic example. I have some prior knowledge about the event that's going to happen. And this is just the marginal probability of this event happening, right? It's just some prior knowledge um, that I know about this event. The probability of B is a probability of observing the data or event on its own. This kind of causes the biggest problems with Bayesian stats. It's also known as a normalizing constant. And the problem is this constant, um, which we'll get into later, is deduced a lot by integrals. And because it's deduced by integrals, it can lead to intractable results, which makes it very hard to compute and normalize our data. But we'll get into that in a later on section. The next one is probability of B given A, and it's the probability of what we believe. So it is known as the likelihood. So how likely was that that this data was generated from this hypothesis? Again, we'll go for an example to really make all this theory concrete. And probability of A given B is something known as a posterior. And it's the probability of our belief after you observe new data. So we have our initial belief about something happening, we get some new data, and then we update what we believe um, using this new information. So we're constantly just changing, or not even changing, refining our hypothesis in our mind in light of new evidence coming in. And that's kind of the idea of Bayesian stats and also Bayesian updating where this all comes from. One last formula I want to show you, again, a lot of maths in this video, is the law of total probability. And this formula is written like this. I'm not going to write it all out. But all it's saying is probability of A is equal to the probability of A and B summing up all the points of B. So you can think of this in two ways. It's the sum of all the overlapping regions at A covers B. So therefore, it's going to be all of A because A covers B and therefore it's going to be all of A and all, all the weighted average of A on B. Don't worry too much about it. Just more if you know this formula, we can then use it later on um, to rewrite Bayes' theorem. But again, don't worry too much about it. As long as you understand the equations and kind of the manipulation we're doing, then that's all you really need to know. Don't worry, don't worry too much about all the like the intuition behind the maths necessarily. Just understand the formula and the basic meaning behind them. So let's now go for an example of applying Bayes' theorem. Let's say we have two decks of cards. One is a normal deck, D1, and now there's a deck that has only red card, D2. I randomly select one of those decks and pull out three of diamonds. Why is the probability that this three of diamonds came from a normal deck? So the way we can begin this problem is by kind of answering a question like, well, what, what deck, how do we pick the first deck, right? So we picked it randomly. So deck one and deck two were, were picked completely by chance. So therefore, we'll say they have a 50-50 chance of getting selected. So the probability of picking deck one is a half, and the probability of picking deck two is also a half because of this random element. And this is the prior probability of our of our question, right? So we, our prior probability that we chose deck one and deck two, given we have information that's a three of diamonds, were our half because we randomly selected them. We, we don't really know. We have no idea. Then... What is the likelihood that a three of diamonds comes from each of these decks? Well, deck one is a normal deck, so a three of diamonds coming from deck one is one out of 52. And a probability of the three of diamonds coming from deck two, which is only red cards, is one out of 26. Makes sense. No, again, nothing too complicated here. These are just the likelihoods of all the conditional probabilities on their own, for the three of diamonds coming from the two decks. Now, what we can do is that we can use a law of the of total probability to calculate the probability of observing the three of diamonds on its own. And by doing that, we use this above formula here. And as you can see here, all it's going to be is that it's going to be the probability of deck one times by the likelihood of three of diamonds happen, gained from deck one, plus the probability of deck two being selected, multiplied by the probability of the three of diamonds coming from deck two. It's a typo, there should be a two here. And by plugging in those values, you know, deck one and deck two, with the probability of choosing them, it's just a half. And uh, pro then the likelihoods we just deduced in this previous section, we can add those into these two sections here. And by multiplying them together and summing them up, we get three over 104. Which, if you think about it, makes intuitive sense, right? Because one out of 52 is the, you know, getting it from deck one. 1 out of 26 is getting from deck 2. Now, 1 out of 26 is the same as 2 out of 54. So adding them together, we get 3 over 104. Makes sense, right? We get 3 of diamonds from those two cases. Conceptually, that makes sense to me. May not to you, but don't worry too much about that. 
just a formula that's all you've got to do to apply base Bayesian stats from first principles or basis theorem from first principles I should say and all we do is that we combine all this information together and what we find is that a probability of deck one generating a three of diamonds is a third now if you think about it that makes sense right because we have one deck which is one out of 52 one deck that's one out of 26 now one out of 26 is double 152 so therefore we're doubly as likely to get the three of diamonds from deck two as opposed to deck one and since it's doubly as likely and probabilities have to sum up to one then we know that deck one must be 33 percent and deck two must be double that which is 66 percent 66 percent times 33 percent is 100 percent and so without using basis theorem we can intuitively show this result all we've done here is on my first principles thinking and using pure equations to get there for most cases you can't just be that intuitive because we're going to have loads of different decks as you can imagine and trying to do it in your head would be too difficult but in this case our intuition matches the result mathematical result which is really good because the theory aligns with basically the empirical values or the empirical equations we've derived which is a good thing and so this is just based in um, basis for in action it's nothing too special what we've done this just thought about the probability of events happening in a different way but it's really really powerful when you get into more deeper problems So we'll now go through over Bayesian updating and Bayesian updating is where we get the real kind of, you know, real use case of, of Bayesian statistics. So Bayesian theorem is all about updating our hypothesis or like our initial view on some problem given new evidence comes in. For example, this is a rewriting of just, you know, Bayesian, of our Bayesian Bayesian theorem we saw in the previous, vid, in previous section, sorry. What we have here is a hypothesis and we have some data and our first data we get given the data point d1 so in this case basis theorem looks like this it's a probability of our hypothesis given this new data point equals the probability of the hypothesis the prior so our initial view whether this hypothesis was true or not times the probability of the data point given the hypothesis all divided by the probability of that data just happening in general again normalizing constant don't worry too much about it Let's say now we get another data point, D2, from our data set. So we have more evidence to evaluate or update our belief or the posterior on. So in this case, what happens is that the prior now becomes the old posterior. So we, you see here, we have our old prior was probability H, but then with a new data point, D2, we then set our posterior to be our new prior, which is probability of H given D1. And this is Bayesian updating. We have an initial belief, we get new evidence, we update that. Then this new probability that we believe by this hypothesis is then becomes the new prior when we get new data. And actually that cycle is Bayesian updating. And that's the kind of the idea where we, like I said, we start off an initial view about something and the more data we get in, the more we refine how likely the, that hypothesis is or other hypotheses are about our problem. And that's how we apply Bayesian updating in practice in most real world problems. Now, the way you generally express this is using this kind of expression, where the posterior is directly proportional to the likelihood times prior. The reason we do Bayesian updating often like this is because the denominator, the probability of the data just happening, is normally intractable and often not needed. So by intractable is that it basically becomes a really complicated integral which i'll cover later on and it becomes very very hard to solve i've linked like a really good thread here that goes over kind of explaining why that's the case but at the moment just take my word for it and the second point is that for m most of the cases we're not really after like concrete probabilities in a lot of cases we may just be after you know what is the most likely outcome and so in that case, normalizing constant doesn't really do much. We just take the value of the highest posterior, that's the most likely hypothesis for that problem. Again, we'll go through an example in a second, but those are the two reasons why we normally express our Bayesian updating steps in this kind of format. So, like I said, let's go through a really concrete example to really drive home a lot of this theory. Let's say we have three dice of different number ranges. Dice 1, 1 to 4, dice 2, 1 to 6, and dice 3, 1 to 8. We randomly select one of those dice, 
and we do three subsequent rolls with that dice. Using these three rolls, after each roll, we can update our, you know, uh, you know, our hypotheses about which dice is most likely, and now become a new posterior, and then we replicate that process for each roll. Now let's go through this step by step. Let's say in the first roll, so we've picked up this random dice and we've rolled it, and we roll the four. What is the probability that we selected dice one, two, or three? Well, the priors for both dice, so probability of picking dice one, dice two, dice three, at the beginning is equally likely. We randomly select it. So therefore, the probability of dice one, two, or three is 33%, yeah? Which makes sense. Now we get into computing the likelihood. So the likelihood is the probability of running dice, probability of running a four for dice one. Now dice four, remember, or dice one, sorry, has numbers one to four, and each of those are equally as likely to be rolled. So therefore, the probability of running a four for dice one is 25%. Likewise, using a similar, you know, of intuition for dice two, it's numbers between one to six. So all we gotta do is basically, you know, it's 16.7% because they're all equally as likely. And then dice three, one to eight, equally as likely, 12.5%. Then we can apply, you know, uh, basis theorem in this following format, where the denominator in this case, like I said, is the law of total probability. So the denominator is 18%, and this value are, is derived from simply summing up all these numerators for the multiple hypotheses. So if we sum up 33 times 25, 33 times 16.7, 33 times 12.5, that value will give you 18%. And that's, so it's just a sum of the, of the likelihood and prior products together. That's what this denominator comes from. And by doing this calculation, we see here that dice one is most likely outcome. Dice one is 46%. So in other words, the most likely dice we have so far, given the current information and current priors, is 46%, or dice is, is dice one with 46%, which makes sense, right? Because it has the smallest range, so therefore rolling a four means it's most likely gonna be that die. And you see here, they drop off as um, the range of the dice increases. Again, go through this slowly if you're a bit stuck because it's not too complicated. It's just really working through the maths in your own time. You really grasp the key or the, the key intuition behind it. So let's say now we have the same dice. We're all, we're all second time. In the second roll, we get a two. However, we have we now have a new prior. So our new priors are now the information we got from the previous roll. So now before we rolled a, a four. So the prior is now probability of dice roll roll four. And you see here, the prior numbers are no longer equal. They've changed because the priors are now what we did in the previous run, right? So you see here, the prior for dice one is now 46%. Dice three, you see here, will be 31%. And for dice, so dice two be 31% and dice three be 23%. And this is the, this is basically an updating an action, right? We're just using our updated posteriors as our new priors when we get new data. And so in this case, when we roll a two, we see here that dice one becomes even more likely to be the dice that we picked up so far, because it's 59%. And this is, like I said, up in action. You see here, the prior is no longer just a prior of dice one. It's a prior of dice one, given we've rolled a four already. And this is where the priors become no longer you know, equal. They become different because we've used historical information to improve our decision making. And like I said, this is Bayesian updating an action, using more and more data to reinforce our hypotheses and make and decipher which one's the most likely. Likewise, the denominator here, we've done the same process. We basically summed up all the products of these numerators to get 91, 9, 19.6%. Again, if you're a bit confused here, I've, the, these formulas are really kind of exhaustive. So make sure if you, if you just read them, you probably understand what's going on. It's not too complicated. Just really take your time to di digest what's going on here. Because uh, like I said, it's, the math is not overly difficult. It's more just the intuition behind the steps we're taking can be a bit tricky to follow. But again, just doing your own time. There's also blogs in the description below to really follow this in, in, a, in a good way. Now, let's say in our third roll with the same dice, we get a five. 
Now, for dice 1, we can't roll a 5 because it ranges from 1 to 4. So therefore, the probability that we have dice 1 is now 0, right? You see here, the probability of the likelihood of rolling a 5 for dice 1 is 0. So the probability that we have it is completely 0 now. And this is the, the idea of, you know, Bayesian updating. We were very, very likely that it was dice 1, you know, more so than the others. But suddenly we rolled, we have some evidence which showed that it can't be dice 1. So therefore, it's completely 0. And in this case, we see dice two becomes more, more likely and is the most likely outcome. And the priors for these dices are now the one, the previous rolls. So the prior for dice two is now the probability of dice two given we rolled a four and a two, which is what we did in the previous scenario. And this prior is 26%, which is what it was in the previous roll, we can, or the previous posterior of the roll. And we, we just follow the same pattern again and again. And this is just, like I said, Bayesian updating, updating our hypotheses with new information that we've gained. And in this case, dice two is the most likely outcome. And this is known as maximum a posteriori uh, or map. Again, I can't speak Latin very well. Um, and this is very analogous to maximum likelihood, but for Bayesian stats. So maximum likelihood is used a lot in Frequentist. And it's just saying what is the most likely outcome given data. Similar for Bayesian, they're saying what is the most likely outcome or the most likely hypothesis given we've had this data. Very similar process. Um, again, don't worry too much about it. I've attached links here if you're interested. Um, but you know, if you got a bit lost in this whole kind of Bayesian updating process, make sure you go through it slowly in your own time because it's really important to grasp this basic before we go into anything more advanced because this is the fundamental building blocks behind Bayesian inference and how it works. Now we're going to take it up a notch and discuss something that's a bit more advanced, a bit more complex. And that's the idea of conjugate priors. Now, I've said it a lot of times in this video that computing this probability of D can be a real bloody mess. Uh, because, like I said, when you have loads of hypotheses, probability of D looks like this integral here. And this integral is often intractable, which basically means it's just so hard and so expensive the computation to compute and it doesn't really have a closed form solution. In other words, it's just really difficult. Um, and I've linked here a good thread if you're interested in learning more about it and why it is so difficult. But the main issue we want to cover is like, well, you know, we don't need this, this denominator in this case for a lot of problems, but sometimes stakeholders may say, well, what is the probability of this event? And if you give them a value that's like arbitrarily high, it's not a probability because it hasn't been normalized. And so it can be really useful in a lot of industries to understand that you know this hypothesis is 80% likely instead of this hypothesis is 1010, you know, it doesn't mean anything. That's just, you know, that's posterior, but it's not been normalized. And that is kind of something we want to address by solving this denominator issue and how do we actually solve this integral. One way, and it's probably the what well, it's the most best way because it gives you the most accurate results, is using, well not the most accurate, it's not an estimation is using conjugate priors. And conjugate priors is when the prior and posterior are of the same distribution. And this allows us to simplify the expression of calculus to posterior. And I'll show you why this is the case and why it's so powerful. There's another way of also calculating this denominator or this integral, and that's the idea of using estimation methods. The most popular is Mon Markov chain Monte Carlo. It's quite a hard thing to really get your head around, but that's how a lot of software use it. We're not, going to go in, we're not going to go into that in this video, but um, it's just to be aware of in case you want to look it up in your own time. So the most famous kind of conjugate priors that exist are binomial and beta. And this is something known as a contingency because they're contingent on each other. Um, I'm not going to go, you know, the beta distribution I've linked here, somewhere on the screen here that you can look up in your own time. Uh, so I'm not going to go too in depth here, but the beta distribution is referred to as a distribution of probabilities because this domain is bounded between zero and one. So all the beta distribution does is that it conveys the most probable probabilities about the success of an event. Again, I'm not going to too in depth here. I've assumed you've got some knowledge of the beta distribution. If not, I really recommend you check out some of these links. I also link something in the description below about a blog I've done on it if you want to get more information. It's not too complicated, but it's well worth knowing quite in depth before this because it really builds the intuition behind why this um, 
conjugate prior works really well for the binomial and beta. Now, the beta distribution can be written in this following format. Again, don't worry too much about it. And this B value is known as the beta function. Alpha is, for example, the number of successes. So say you flip a coin um, 10 times and you get seven heads, where head is a, is a success. Alpha, in that case, is seven, and beta will be three. So, you know, this this kind of B value is a, is a value of successes and failures as part of beta distribution. And then that kind of will dictate what's the most probable uh, prob probable probability for a success. And that example will be like 70% because seven out of 10 were heads. So therefore the most likely um, probability of success is 70. In reality, that's not the case. We know that because we're Bayesians, we're not using frequentist methods, but that's a really simple example um, if you want to think about it that way. Now the binomial distribution is very similar and that's kind of where the idea of con conjugate prize comes from. They come from a similar family. And the binomial distribution conveys a probability of a certain number of successes, k, happening from n trials, where the probability of success is x. Now, this sounds very, very similar to the beta distribution. And in fact, the key difference between the binomial and beta is that for the beta distribution, the probability x is a random variable. But for the binomial distribution, the probability x is a fixed parameter. And so you can see how they're kind of one and the same, but they're just varying up what they're trying to measure the probability of. And that's the idea of contingencies, where they're very similar, but kind of different. And so they're being used in different parts of Bayes' theorem. So like I said, let's relate that information to Bayes' theorem. So let's say we, want to re re we will start with rewriting Bayes' theorem using the probability of success x for an event and the data k. So X is our hypothesis. We want to know, you know, what is our hypothesis of this event or the possible probability of this event being a success? That's the hypothesis we want to measure. And that value can be between anywhere between zero and one. So it's kind of continuous in a sense. And the data we're going to use to update our hypothesis is K. So we want to use the data to work out what is the probability of success of this event. And that is kind of, you know, framing of this problem. So we can rewrite it the following. And all I've done here is just substitute the values in. And we can also expand this den denominator to be the integral, the law of total probability that we've seen before. So our posterior is basically the probability distribution over all the possible probabilities of the success rate. So zero to one. In other words, the posterior is a beta distribution. Very simple, yeah? That's, this is what we've done here. It's just rewriting and reframing the problem using this contingency. Now, what we do here, I know it's escalated quite quickly, is that we sub in the binomial and the beta uh, distribution, uh, their, their, prob their probability density functions, into that formula. And this is what we get. Again, don't worry too much about this. It's just really working in the, math in the deep mathematics, but you don't spend too much time really thinking about this. It's just, it's just a basic substitution of these values into here. Now we can simplify this. As you can see, this value here can kind, of like kind of jump out, right? This x minus alpha, one minus beta, these can all kind of be, you know, um, simplified. And we can also bring out this these constants that we don't need. And then we have left with this thing here. Now, some of you, I don't know who, to be honest, may find something special about the integral in the denominator here that kind of one to zero um, it is actually the definition of the beta function if you knew that wow i'm amazed i mean you know i don't know how people discovered that but if you're aware of this integral being a beta function fair play to you you're much smarter than i am um, but like i said this is a very like a well known, not say well known it's a known result that this equals this falling formula where beta so k like i said is number of successes and alpha is like our new evidence Likewise, this is going to be our failure rate, in this case, beat, um, uh, beta. And we can update it, or our final form, to look like this. Now, the question is, why? What have I done all this complicated maths to rewrite an equation for, for, what, for, for, you know, for what God knows reason? So, the, beautiful, like, the beauty behind this result is that it's that to do Bayesian updating, 
we no longer need to compute the product of the likelihood and prior. Do you remember going back to that old example where we were multiplying the numerators or we were, you know, multiplying, we were summing up all those numerators and adding them together to give us our, you know, our denominator? Well, in this formula, we don't need to, right? Because you see here, it's just a function. B, this b value is just a function, it's the beta function. As long as we know the number of successes and our new data, alpha, and, you know, our current um, total, what's the word, trials, these are values we all know. And to do that, we don't need, no need, no longer need to, you know, sum up all these numerators. We can just simply add it to this beta function. And this is just computationally efficient, right? We're no longer wasting so many costs just adding and summing up these values. And it makes it a lot more feasible to do Bayesian inference. And we could just use simple addition. And that's where it really speeds up this whole process. And we've avoided using that integral as a whole, right? We've done no long summations. We've just done a very, very simple kind of, you know, um, manipulation of the PDFs of the binomial and beta distribution. And then that's given us this really neat result here. And to me, that's quite amazing. Um, again, there's another famous contingency, which is the Poisson and Gamma. I've also, there's a, my blog below details that, but you can do a very similar process where these things just fall out of these distributions and that makes it so amazing to work with and really simple. Right, let's now go through, you know, a real life example to really make all this theory and concrete and show how it can be used in real life industries. So let's go and visit the MLB or the Major League Baseball. So the rate the batters hit a ball in, in MLB is divide, is known as the batting average. And this is something where number of balls you face divided by how many you hit. Well, number you hit divided by how many balls you face. So the batting average in MLB was 24.4%. So roughly every four balls a, a batter faces, they hit one of those. Let's say that we have a player, a new rookie to the season, as you will. He starts the season very well and he hits his first three balls. Now, what would his batting average be? Now, if we were just frequentist, we would just say, well, you know, that's all the data says is that he's hit three from three, so therefore his average must be 100%. But that doesn't sound right, right? You know, if, if a player at football will, you know, score in his first game, it doesn't mean he's gonna score every single game. It does, you know, intuition will tell us that's not true. So we can use a Bayesian approach to reach a different conclusion, which is probably more sensible. So let's start with just discussing the prior and like what, what do we think most batters average? So we know the average is 24.4% and a good average for my research, I'm not a big MLB expert, is considered to be around 30%. And that's like a kind of the upper range of like a feasible average. And one below 20% is considered to be quite bad. So Using that information, I can construct a prior. Now, the problem is this prior is completely subjective to me. I may say this prior is going to be, you know, this beta one is going to be, you know, it's going to be very unlikely to be below 20%, so I'm going to have a tail off there, and very unlikely to be above 30%, so I'm going to have a tail off here. And because of that, I'm then going to say, well, you know, these the values that make this distribution look sensible is alpha equals 49 and beta equals 151 and I've just attached a beta distribution to this information. But like I said, this is completely subjective to me. This is my opinion of what the prior looks like. And this is the big criticism behind Bayesian stats because it's subjective. There's no objective information here. It's just a personal belief about a problem. And experts may get to different outcomes. And I can make say, for example, the prior batting average, in my opinion, is 80%. And people say oh, I'm wrong. Well, like, well, it's my opinion. You know, I'm not wrong. It's just my opinion, and that's where Bayesian stats can have its pitfalls. But the 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 more data you get about situation, the more you're just. So like I may say it's eighty percent, but surely with enough data, I will eventually converge to a true value, which realistically will be between twenty and thirty percent of batting averages, and that's kind of the outcome of Bayesian statistics. But, you know, most people will probably choose quite sensible priors, like I have done here in this case. The next step is to calculate the likelihood and posterior. So the likelihood of the data is that this new player has hit three from three. So therefore they have an extra three successes and zero failures. 
So all we've got to do is add an extra three to the value of alpha in zero to beta. So remember that's the beta distribution we discussed earlier. And by doing this, what we can see here is that the posterior distribution of this of this batter's um, mean, or the whole like most likely battling average he has, moves a bit to the right, which makes sense because he's he's currently hitting more than the average. So therefore, his mean will probably be higher than the average. And you see here, it's slowly shifted to the right. So intuitively, it all works out well. But he's not so far different, you know, from the mean so far because he's he's only hit three from three. He's not a hundred percent as a frequency would say, but a bit more to the right of, of the mean that we expect because he's currently better than the mean at the current moment in time. Now, like I said, it makes sense why his belly shifted because he's only hit three balls, which is not a lot of data. What if we now say the player hit 40 out of 50 balls? In this case, we would add 40 to the alpha and 10 to the beta. And you see now his posterior shifts a lot more to the right because he's had a lot more data and he's keeping up that average for a lot for a longer period of time or more data points. So therefore you see his average is now a lot different from the mean player or his mean batting average. And so this is kind of with more information, the the posterior gets more and more correct as well, because we kind of reach that population of the data as opposed to a sample. Um, and this is kind of how we're using it for real world problems. And this is something they use in the MLB all the time about kind of estimating people's batting averages. So let's quickly summarize of the key points we discussed in this video. Bayes' theorem is on its own, is nothing about it that is Bayesian stats. It's just a rearranged version of conditional probability. And it's the way we kind of apply it in principle, is how determines whether it's Bayesian inference or frequentist. And Bayesian, you know, like I said, it's, it's, you don't think of it as Bayes' theorem. Think of it as just a philosophical view about how we apply statistics and derive, you know, probabilities from statistical situations. The main idea behind Bayes' theorem is that we update our probability about an event in a lot of new information, which is refining our hypotheses every time we get new data in. And that's kind of how us humans think. You know, we, in light of new information, we may reevaluate our views on certain problems that we, we face. To apply Bayesian updating, all you've got to do is start with initial belief called the prior. The problem is this prior is often subjective because it's up to the individual to decide a suitable prior. And what's suitable is, you know, it's not clear. And this is a big criticism behind Bayesian stats. However, you know, in most cases, most people who have a bit of knowledge about the industry would probably choose a suitable prior in most cases. And finally, the trickiest part behind Bayesian stats is estimating the marginal probability of the event happening on its own. In other words, of observing the data on its own. And the problem is this denominator is often an integral and this integral is often intractable, which means you can't really calculate it um, you know, by brute force, it's just too hard. And this is where things like conjugate priors come in handy, where it allows us to simplify Bayes' theorem for certain distributions of data to remove the to remove like that barrier to calculating that denominator. So if you enjoyed this video, um, make sure you like and comment. And I'd like to hear your thoughts if you enjoyed this video more than my previous ones. This one's been a bit more in depth, a bit longer and a lot more of a, 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 like I said, a deep dive behind Bayesian stats. If you're interested in learning more about Bayesian stats, you can check it out on my blog, which will be linked in the description below. I will also have the following channels. Obviously, this YouTube channel, I do a lot of data science, statistics stuff, so feel free to check out my other videos if you're interested. Also, my GitHub and linked, um, my, my Twitter, sorry, have a lot of information as well regarding these blogs. And also, I write a weekly newsletter every Monday that's just my views on data science, some advice for people in the field, um, everything data science related. So feel free to check that out. That'll be linked in the description below as well. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you like, comment and subscribe. Now see you in the next one.